Good morning. It's wonderful to be gathered together in this time of worship and welcome to St. Andrews. A special welcome to those who may be joining us later in the week through our YouTube channel. We're so pleased that you take the time to worship with us and hope you have a sense of being part of this St. Andrews community as well. Today there's a couple of themes that are happening that I want to share with you. First of all, that later in the week, it will be Children's Day. United Nations designates this special day when we remember the blessing of children, but also remember our responsibility to ensure that the rights of the child are lived within our communities and within our families. This week is also Transgender Awareness Week. As we move towards the Day of Remembrance, when we think about those who have suffered because of our fear and under misunderstanding of who they are. And so you may listen to some of the CBC or other news programs this week that open the doors for us to understand this community in a healthier and more compassionate way. Children and all people are part of our community and it's important that we support and nurture and cherish them. Each Sunday we recognize that we gather on the traditional territory of the Nipissing First Nation and we give thanks for their sacred traditions that care for land and creation and as we give thanks we also commit ourselves to walking in respect towards truth and reconciliation. We light our Christ candle. As a symbol of Christ's presence with us, a loving presence that draws us into the work of the gospel, that reassures us in the moments of our darkness, and that guides us on the path towards the fullness of life. It is that light that we share with one another in community. And as we light our community candle today, we particularly remember the children who really haven't been with us very much since the pandemic. And we remember those in our community who are transgender and our thoughts and our compassion reaches out. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. So on this Sunday when we celebrate Children's Day, come, come as a little child, full of wonder, with curiosity enter into this sacred time. Let your heart be warmed by the grace of God. Let your soul feel the peace of the Holy One's presence. Here in worship, we open ourselves to be touched by loving grace. Here, there is holy abundance, grace enough for all, love enough for all, blessings enough for all. And so we sing praise in playful adoration as we offer all that we are and all that we have in worship. Our opening hymn reminds us of Jesus' invitation to come to the kingdom of God as a child, like a child. Thank 
We are a singing community, but we are also a praying community. And so I invite you to join with me in our gathering prayer. Holy God, source of our life and every blessing, gather we your people into a community of generous spirit. Help us to see that all we have comes from you, our God who creates all that is. When we are tempted to hold what we have tightly, loosen our grip with compassion. When we are fearful of what we might lose, reassure us that your grace is always sufficient. When we compare when we can give by what others have, remind us that Christ was willing to give his all. Help us to be a giving people, not counting the cost, but rejoicing in the opportunity to share your love, your grace, and your bounty. God of all, hear our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So this morning's story is one that I am sure many of you, if not most of you, will find familiar. It's called The Widow's Might, because in the King James translation of the story, the coins that she brings as her offering are referred to as mites. Before we get to the story, we might want to remember the context in which this appears in Mark's Gospel. It's the last week of Jesus' life. He's already entered Jerusalem in that wonderful Palm Sunday celebration. And then the stories tell time and time again how Jesus goes to the temple. And, well, he's not very pleased with what he sees. He even overturns the temple tables and throws out the money changers. He talks about whether the religious leaders have understood the gifts they've been given and how they are to use. So during that week in Jerusalem, that week between Palm Sunday and Good Friday, on I think about the third day, Jesus goes to the temple again. And this is a story that Mark shares. A large crowd had gathered listening to Jesus teach. And he said, beware of the scribes and the religious leaders. They like to wear their long gowns in the marketplace and to be given respect. They find their places of honor in the synagogue and are often given the very best places at the banquets. But they devour the homes of the widows, cause the widow to lose her place. But God will see that they have their condemnation. Remaining in the temple, Jesus moved closer to the offering box, 
the treasury, where people would bring their offerings. And he watched. He watched as those who had, who were rich and affluent, made great offerings of great sums. And then he watched as a widow came to the offering box and took out two small coins, less, worth less than a penny. And she dropped them into the box. Jesus called his disciples over and said, this woman has given more than all of the rest. The others, they gave out of their abundance. They gave what they had no need for. But this widow, she has given her all. Everything she has. Her very living for tomorrow. May this story live and move within us. Our reading today is uh, 1 Chronicles 29, 10 to 18, New International Version, David's Prayer. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. 
But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided with, for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. I know, my Lord, that you test the heart, you are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. These words are offered as wisdom for yeah. journey. Let us walk together in their truth. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, who is our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So for generations, the story of the widow's might was an inevitable preaching moment in that stewardship season of the church. I mean, what other story warms our hearts by this woman who is giving, willing to give so very much. We've heard the story so often, and there have been so many sermons preached about it. You could probably preach to me about its meaning. You could tell me that the size of the gift doesn't matter nearly as much as the attitude of the heart that gives it. You could tell me that this is an opportune time to talk about proportional giving, to think about not the amount of the particular offering, but how it is a proportion of all the treasures that we hold. You might tell me that this widow's might is a reminder as the text was that Sheila just read for us from the Old Testament, that everything we have after all is already God's, and we are simply returning what we have been given. All wonderful themes for the season of stewardship in the church. But we've heard the story so often that sometimes the widow simply becomes a model of giving. She's like caught in this image of being heroic, faithful, self-giving, sacrificial. And sometimes her presence actually, well, just makes us feel a little guilty that we can't quite live up to what she did. If only I was willing to give so much. If only I could be so emptying as she was. And maybe I get more pangs of guilt because after all I'm one of those religious leaders and from time to time I put on the long flowing gown and the liturgical garb and yes I have a place of respect in community and yes, I'm often given places of honor. And, well, if you gave me the chance, prayers might be longer than they necessarily need to be. <laughs> so let's look at this story again. It's not just a story about an offering that by all accounts is simply small potatoes. Insignificant, really equivalent to a penny? We don't even have those anymore. One sixteenth of a day's wage in the time in which the widow lived? 
hardly enough to do any great work of charity with, hardly enough to put up a new belfry, a small gift. And yet her story has so inspired the church over time that it is a story not of small potatoes, but of great significance. But to move deeper into the story, I think we really have to see this widow. Not just see her act of placing two coins in the offering box, but see her. She's almost invisible as she moves to the temple. She would have had virtually no status in the community in which she lived. She lost all of that when she lost her husband. And yet, Jesus notices her. What did Jesus notice? Not whether she was old or young or had children to care for or was homeless. Because we're not told any of those things in the story. So there must be something else that Jesus noticed about her. Why Jesus finds her presence so significant that he calls his disciples over and says, hey boys, you should take note of this. The widow, some commentators suggest, in this final week of Jesus' life, becomes the reflection he sees of what God is asking him to give no less than everything, all that he has, his very means of survival for tomorrow. And when he sees that widow, for a moment, he understands why he's being asked to give that. Because out of her poverty, out of the injustice of the systems that say she has no worth, this woman in an act of defiance and self-worth says, I can give. I will be not defined by those who would put me down. Rather, I will be this child of God, I will give as God has given me. And she touches the heart of Christ. He looks at her and he sees what humanity can be how humanity can live into the discipleship, the vision of the realm of God that we celebrate next Sunday. This widow is unlike others in the Gospel of Mark. Remember that rich young man who couldn't follow? Because he just couldn't bear leaving behind what he had. Remember those teachers of the law, the religious leaders, whom Jesus says devour the very homes of widows, who cheat them out of a place to live, who use the temple for their own means. And then remember this woman, as she stands before us and makes her offering. Indeed, it's no small potatoes. It makes every difference because it speaks to the power of the gospel to love and care. Jesus doesn't tell stories or make observations around him in order to make us feel guilty. 
Jesus tells stories and makes observations in order that we might see the world differently. See the world through God's eyes. And you know, the world changes around us. Thirty years ago, when I was new in ministry and on my first stewardship preaching campaign, I came across a story about small potatoes. The story goes that once there were a group of farmers, we might call it a co-op, who lived around a village. And they had great success with their potato crop. They were known far and wide for growing these really big potatoes that French fry companies just loved because they were so easy to make French fries out of. They prospered. And out of their prosperity, they were able to hire folks from the village in all kinds of aspects of the business. But over time, the farmers became so focused on making sure that the company that was buying their potatoes got the very biggest and best, that they began to keep the seconds, the small ones, for seed. And so over time, year after year, this crop of potatoes that were known for their size and quality, they actually began to be smaller and smaller. So 30 years ago, that story had resonance because it spoke to the intention that if we only plant small potatoes, that's all we're going to reap is small potatoes. And if we plant big potatoes, we're going to have a bumper crop of blessing. So what we need to do is to give big gifts in order to multiply and grow the crop that God has given us. And that's a good stewardship lesson, right? But something has changed. And you know what's changed? When I go to the grocery store, some weeks, I pay more for this tiny little bag of small potatoes than I would pay for 10 pounds of regular sized potatoes. We see small potatoes differently than we did. And if we were part of the small potato company, we might actually think that good stewardship was about planting small potatoes. So we need to ask ourselves, as those who care for our community, for our place of worship, for our temple, do we need to learn to see things differently? Could it be that we need to learn to value the small potatoes? That we need to live into being a smaller community, a smaller presence, but equally as faithful? Could it be that stewardship for us is about looking at the resources that we have to plant and wondering how best and most faithfully we can use our small potatoes to do something significant and wondrous. Something that when Jesus notices it, Christ sees our faithfulness and our discipleship. So by all means, the story that so many of us have heard from our Sunday school days of the widow giving her two mites, her two coins, we need to take that to heart. But it's not a message that says, give till you hurt. It's not a message that says, we need the poor to give all that they have to sustain our religion. It's not a message that says we can walk by the homeless person on the street and pretend we don't notice. 
it's not a message that says we can ignore the single mom who comes to the food bank, but we don't really want to hear her story. The widow stands here, right in front of us, right next to our offering box. And what she says by her presence is that we can be defiant givers who believe that our giving can make a difference. That we can, by the way we live our faith and discipleship, reflect that ultimate gift of Christ who gives all that he is for the sake of us, for the sake of the world. And that, that, my friends, is no small potatoes. Thanks be to God. For the past few weeks, we have been focusing on the call to live as God's stewards in the world and in our community, the church. And this morning, I invite Bethany to come and share with us our final moment for stewardship. So thanks, guys. <laughs> um, I was a young adult before I knew what the word stewardship actually meant within our church life. I did know, uh, though sort of 
organically that it meant to give. Um, but, and I also generally understood that it, meant, that it also meant to have care of something. And I have been taught through example, not just from my family, but through everyone here, past and present, about how to do that. It's time, it's talent, and it is, of course, treasure, as the saying goes. Time, like money, can be difficult to give, sometimes more difficult to give than money. There never seems to be enough hours in the day or days in the week or weeks in the month or months in the year. We mean to do things. We mean to use our time more thoughtfully. And it's hard to do. But it can be as easy as volunteering to fold bulletins for half an hour. It can be as easy as helping check names at the door on Sunday morning. It's 30 minutes, an extra 30 minutes, granted. So maybe you have to get out of the house a little bit quicker. <laughs> but you can do it. There are a bunch of people who have volunteered to do it, and we are so grateful when they do. The reopening team is, is always very grateful when somebody says, yes, I will do that. Things like this help keep the show on the road, as we say, on, particularly on Sunday morning, but there are other things that people can do. And that's sort of where talent comes in. Talent feels tricky, doesn't it? We're probably all sitting here thinking, I'm not very talented. I don't have a talent, but we all do. There are those of us who bake. There are those of us who provide tech support, and that's the result up there. This is the result right here. The camera in front of me is also the, that result. And there are those of us who volunteer at Food Bank uh, and provide for our downtown neighbors. There are those of us who count the offering, but another big important job. All of this is talent, and time, of course, but it's also talent, and they're important ones to our church life. And of course, treasure. It's the hard one to talk about, isn't it? Uh, it's probably harder just generally to talk about money, including here at church. But I think having care of this place and stewardship means giving all the ways, of course. And helping keep the lights on here means we can do things like keep the food bank open and provide for our community, big or small. And now, I want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who gives in the box uh, on Sunday morning. Thank you if you use PAR. Um, thank you if you give of your time. Thank you if you give of your talent any time you have done that, whether you've done it once, whether you do it weekly, whether you do it yearly. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for having care of this place along with me. So let's keep doing that. I should have noted when I invited Bethany forward that she is part of the little group of people who have been steering our conversations about stewardship and providing the information that you've received in the bulletin or through the online newsletter. So to Derek and to Natalie and to Bethany, thank you for being a part of bringing that important conversation uh, to our table. Thank you for the many ways that you give of yourselves and your gifts to share and support this ministry. And so we bring our two mites and we offer them with this song of dedication.
Let us pray. Giver of every good and perfect gift, with gratitude we sing your praise. You pour out blessings without measure and ask only love. Accept these our gifts as a token of our love, and through love, multiply them to bless others in Christ's name. Amen. I invite Louise to come and lead us in prayer. Let us, sorry, let us pray together. O oh, mystery we call God, we give thanks for this community and that we are able to gather together both in person and through the magic of technology. This week I've been thinking a lot about this community and other communities I belong to and how best to navigate in this forever altered post-pandemic world. Patient God, help us find our way through this new landscape. Help us to move forward with determination to do better. Help us also to remember the past and retain the lessons we've so recently learned. Help us please repair what has been broken due to COVID and build what was never there before. We have the knowledge and the ability to make this world a much, much better place. Let us make the correct choices, difficult as they may be, and do the work, demanding as that may be. We must never stop talking about truth and reconciliation, every child matters, black lives matter, anti-racism, global warming, but we must do so much more than talk. Gracious God, please be our companion as we walk this path. If at times we rush ahead, please understand we will always stop and wait. If at times we fall behind, please understand we need to catch up to you. Remind us when we're climbing a seemingly endless hill that we can pause and admire the view while we catch our breath. If we get lost, remind us that we have compass and map and can find a route home. Generous God, help us to see the beauty in cold, wet weather as easily as we do in warm sunshine, and help us to cherish the everyday moments as well as the wondrous. At bumps in the road, help us to stay the course. At forks in the path, guide us which direction to follow. Loving God, in some ways we are each walking this path alone, in others we are walking as a group. Let us always remember to care for our fellow travelers. In times of sorrow, let us provide comfort. In times of need, let us provide strength. In times of joy, let us celebrate. Let us always love those strangers we meet along the trail all those strangers, those who do not look or think or speak or live as we do, the homeless, the addicts, the struggling, the broken, those with stories we cannot know, those with challenges seen and unseen. Merciful God, please hear the names we are saying now aloud and silently in our hearts, and know we are asking for your help in giving hope, in healing, in holding these loved ones close. Ramona, Doug, Beloved God, help us travel this journey with a sense of purpose and with grace and with compassion. These are our prayers. Amen.
We conclude our worship this morning with a hymn that reminds us that indeed this is God's world, that every gift is one that comes to us by the hand of our eternal, everlasting, generous, and gracious God. We, we cannot own the sunlit sky. We hope that you will join us next week as we celebrate the end of the liturgical church year, the reign of Christ. And Donna Sinclair, who's sitting up in the balcony this morning, will be sharing with you uh, the message for the day. And so as we go from this place, we go to live the call to be disciples, to give not just a little, but to give in a way that makes a difference. To share our lives with one another. To encourage one another into the fullness of living. We cannot do this alone. We go because we are blessed by the God who creates us in love the God who through Christ redeems our life for a purpose, and the God who through the Spirit encourages us each day of our path. Go, knowing that you are blessed and loved. Amen.